participated in that and volunteers and for the Kids Corner Preschool, they were very present down there too as well. So uh, a thank you to everyone who, who participated and volunteered and, and helped out with that. Thank you very much. Uh, today, Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, this is Labor Day weekend. Also, it's pastries with the pastor. So if anyone would like to come back and have a conversation with me as a pastor or any question, all questions about the denomination, the church, you're more than welcome. We'll be meeting around noon up in the library after the second worship. I say after the second worship because I truly want to give you as much time as you need to address any of your questions, to make myself as available as I possibly can. So it's hard for me. I can't necessarily do that. Um, in between the two services. So if you do have questions for me, I am available. I'll be there. And <laughs> we didn't give away all those cookies. So there will be cookies with the pastor today. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe just stop by and take a, a small plate or something with you. <laughs> anyways, I um, should add some down here for Cafe Grace this morning. But anyways, um, another couple of announcements. Not a lot going on. Next Sunday, okay, this is new. Next Sunday, Sunday... September 10th, we are going to have a dinner down here in Bethany Hall after our second worship service. So we're going to call it a, a garden dinner because we're going to be preaching on the, the message will come from Genesis chapter 2. And we will be kicking off our, our, our lectionary year, the next narrative lectionary term, Storytelling Through the Bible, where we go through uh, starting the book of Genesis, a lot of the Old Testament. And we'll be preaching exclusively through, from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, once we get to um, after the Christmas story and into uh, Epiphany and Lent and Easter. So Mark will be what we're talking about a lot next year. And again, we'll be doing a kickoff to the Narrative Lectionary next Sunday, September 10th. Uh, we've got a lot of volunteers. We've got a lot of food. And we've got time and space. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So next Sunday, Fellowship, uh, there will be a, a, a dinner. That is what I have. Elders meeting next Sunday. So, again, elders are supposed to be reading the Gospels and the Book of Acts before we get gather for elders next Sunday. All right. That's, any other announcements? Am I missing anything? The school thing happening? Um, I kind of, yeah, I don't. <laughs> You're more than welcome to go ahead and, and do that on your own. I think I needed some help this past week to go ahead and plan and set some different things up, and we didn't do that. So, all right. Yeah, the school thing that Pamela was just talking about was uh, praying for the schools as uh, they're all getting started here, and some have already started, and some are getting started this week. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be an organized thing. We can all pray for sure, and let's, let's lift those prayers up to the schools. Welcome to everybody this morning to Cafe Grace, uh, including you out there in, in Cyberland. And, you know, that's, that's really a nice thing uh, because last week Terry and I were on vacation, and we happened to be traveling through the mountains in eastern Kentucky on U.S. Route 23 last Sunday morning at this time. And we were able to join the worship service through the, through the uh, transmission. And it was really wonderful. We got to hear Bill open and, 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 and Pastor Kevin preach on forgiveness. And, and Brenda lead, lead us through communion and, and all that. So it's really a nice thing. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. But, you know, we do have to be a little careful what we take in on the Internet. I was watching a TV show here a while back, and I've, I've shared this. I just thought it was a funny little bit that they did on this show. Two guys, uh, businessmen, were talking to each other on the phone, and they got their business taken care of, and then they just got into the friend's small talk. And the one guy asked the other one, he said, well, how's your daughter doing? Does she get out of college and everything? He said, yeah, she's out. And he said, well, so I suppose she's ready to join the family business. He says, no, she's become an Internet influencer. And the guy says, I don't even know what that means. And the guy says, it means I failed as a father. <laughs> That's not necessarily the case, maybe. But we do have to be careful about what we listen to and look at on the Internet and what we believe. And what made me think about this, here, uh, sometime back, I stumbled across something that was such hogwash, I couldn't believe it, that somebody was trying to promote as truth. And I wish I could remember what it was, but yet, on the same, by the same token, probably isn't worth repeating because it was hogwash. But we have to be so careful about what we believe. And some people buy into anything. And we have to be very, very careful and selective on that. I really believe that with the way we can put things out there, I could make something up and somebody would believe it. 
I could say, you know, well, it's been proven by research that if you face northwest and seated at the table and eat your food with your less dominant hand, it will, you will digest it much better. And people would believe stuff like that. Just more hogwash, right? We have to be careful. But there are certain things we can believe, and we always know that. And scripture, of course, gives us many, many, many things. And some that we know so well. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You can take that to the bank. You can take that to heaven. John 14, 6, Jesus, or, yes, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can believe that. You can, you can understand it. You can believe it. You can depend on it. And Philippians 4, 8, Paul wrote this in some of his final words to the Philippians. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And there's a footnote in my Bible and many, many of the versions you would read on this verse with that think about, there's a footnote that says take account of. And that means that you look at these things, these things that are commendable, pure, pleasing, uh, and all this, you use those as the standards to weigh things against when you're trying to make a decision or to see if something is true or something is worthwhile. Use those kinds of standards in your life and you will be, you will be all right. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in this hour of worship. We ask you to be with Pastor Kevin as he brings the message in your word and that we take it into our hearts, that we know that what he is going to share this morning from your word is true. We can depend upon it. But at the same time, he's a human being. We need to listen to what he says and discern for ourselves what truth is right for us from his message. He can only do so much. We have to, take, we have to do our part as well and, and ask your spirit to help us decide what truth is and what is the best for us and how we can influence the world around us in the proper way as well. So be with him as, as he speaks. Let the spirit work through him and, and into our hearts and into our minds. Be with us as we commune together at the table and remember the great sacrifice that came only from you that could could only come from you and what the meaning that that has for us be with us this morning and this week to come we pray be with us with those uh, in schools as they go back and get it into their activities this year we know it's a challenging time and a transitional time for them be with the teachers the students the administrators and the, the bus drivers you name it the custodians there are so many people that are parts of this, the coaches. There are so many people that, that have an impact and influence on our children. Be with them. Pray, we pray that they are, are the right impact, that, that they are doing the right things, that they are looking to you for guidance as well. Uh, you are the one that, that can teach us the best. Let us emulate you in all things. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to share a quick stewardship moment with you all. So often, Jesus' words in the Gospels are, are completely flipped from what we understand that we would, um, what we'd expect to hear. I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, and Jesus is going to take his place at the table, and he says to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Such an upside-down world continues when we find our greatest delight in giving rather than in receiving. I'm going to share a quick story with you, and maybe you've heard this before. But a woman, she was traveling along in the mountains, and she found a precious stone in a stream. The next day, she met another traveler who was hungry. The woman opened her bag to share her food. The hungry traveler saw the precious stone, and he asked the woman to give it to him. And she did so without any hesitation. The traveler left, rejoicing in his great fortune. He knew the stone was worth enough to give him security for a lifetime. But a few days later, he came back and found the woman and wanted to return that stone to that woman. He declared, I know how valuable the stone is, but I give it back in the hope 
that you can give me something more precious. Give me what you have within you that enabled you to give me that stone. The woman smiled. The joy of giving. I'm going to offer a prayer now for the gifts that we will present later on within the service as we come forward for communion. Ever giving God, because we are your beloved creatures, we know you've first given us such abundance, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land to live on, love, life. In gratitude, we will offer a portion of what you have given to us. We ask you to accept our gifts, Holy One, as signs of our love to you and for our desire to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Help us to use these resources and to share your good news with those who struggle to live. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our scripture today does come from Luke chapter 22. We're going to start with verse 14 and read through 30. When the time came, Jesus took his place at the table, and the apostles joined him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I won't eat of it until it is fulfilled in God's kingdom. After taking a cup and giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. I tell you that from now on I won't drink from the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom has come. After taking the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal and said, This cup is the new covenant by my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, my betrayer is with me. His hand is on this table. The human one, the son of man, goes just as it has been determined. But how terrible it is for that person who betrays him. The apostles began to argue among themselves about which of them it could possibly be who would do this? An argument broke out among the disciples, apostles, over which one of them should be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles rule over their subjects, and those in authority over them are called friends of the people. But that's not the way it will be with you. Instead, the greatest among you must become like a person of lower status and the leader like a servant. So which one is greater, the one who is seated at the table or the one who serves at the table? Isn't, isn't it the one who is seated at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are the ones who have continued with me in my trial. And I confer royal power on you, just as my father granted royal power to me. Thus you will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. I'll offer another quick prayer. Heavenly Lord, we ask the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Christ, amen. So what's in a name? Do any of you all have nicknames? Yeah. <laughs> we, we do. We do. We give nicknames to others, too. The thing about nicknames is that rarely does anyone get to pick their own. Right? How many of you have picked your own nickname? We all have them, but I don't see anybody saying that they picked their own nickname. Rather, nicknames... They're earned, or they're assigned to you. A title can sometimes be a nickname. And this applies especially to those of you who are grandparents. You're, you're not just grandma or grandpa, are you? You're a nana, right? Or you're Grammy, pup pup, or, or papa, something along those lines, right? <laughs> These enduring terms are given by the little ones who speak an entirely different language than us, one that is not yet fully developed. And these words, though, they still mean something 
much more than, than just a point on a twig of a family tree diagram. And you grandparents, you, you know these titles. You, you own them. You live into this identity. You understand the language of love that these young ones speak. I've had my share of nicknames, <laughs> and some of them I am not yet comfortable sharing in the context of a sermon that is live streamed and then <laughs> permanently placed on, on uh, the internet for forever. But all of my nicknames, they all have stories of fondness that I associate with each and every one of them. The stories have a commonality that are woven between them all. People that have come to know me through a relationship have identified a character trait in me, and they decided I should be known more as by those traits than by my, my given name. Whether I was seen as someone that was dependable and being able to deliver in clutch moments, or as a person that could be, <laughs> that would be determined to see something through all the way to the end without being deterred by any sort of speculated attitudes or the impressions of others. The shorthand to that is that uh, I would do my own thing to the end without caring what others thought. Uh, or as one, also another nickname is one that uh, I would work through the night to hone in on my craft, become a perfectionist. Or, or maybe and sometimes it was just my energy level that I was exhibiting. It's not uncommon for me here locally to be introduced as Rev Kev. I did not pick that name for myself. <laughs> Others put that name on me. And I feel like I have to live into being Rev Kev. That's my name. It's an identity that I've been assigned. And I'm of mind where I think I just need to own that title. I need to live into it, especially as others in the community are introducing me as, as Rev Kev. I'll own it. I imagine in this room there are all sorts of nicknames, pet names, and endearing terms that we're all known by. Some of the names perhaps we wish we could shed and would really like it if folks would just quit calling us that. But there are some names. We own them. We like what they stand for and try our best not to let anybody down. But here's the thing, though. It's a lot harder to live into an idea than it is to live into a name. We're not perfect. Sometimes we fail to live into our identity. When Jesus was at the Passover meal with his apostles, his apostles, they let us all down. In Luke's gospel, back all the way in chapter 6, Jesus prayed up on the mountaintop, and he chose these apostles, these 12, from all his disciples. And we are meant to believe that these 12 were different. They were the someones that were special to be seen at an elevated status. And here we are reading from chapter 22, the Gospel of Luke, and we can't help but to imagine the chaos that is occurring at table. Jesus kicks it off and then drives, it, drives this chaos with his words, I desired to be here with you before I suffer. That sounds like a great way to start a Thanksgiving meal, right? Let's try this in November. <laughs> I wanted to be here before I suffer. You know, that's just... And later, Jesus, he's pretty blunt. He accuses his betrayer, but he doesn't name any names. Like, he's just trying to rile these guys up, right? Like, one of you's going to betray me. His hand's on the table, you know? Which one is it? Why does he do this? It gets, to say that that gets everybody going, I feel, is a real, real understatement. Because the apostles, they all start to argue, it isn't me. And this argument, again, this is an argument. There are 12 men. We don't sit 12 people at a table down here in Cap. Well, we max out at eight, right? We don't want that many people. We all want to be able to, to share and, and talk. 12 people, that's, that's everybody on the ice of a hockey game. 
and nobody's playing on the same team. That's, that's chaos. The argument organically transitions from denying to blaming and then on to praising themselves as the greatest. They're going to elevate, elevate themselves above the one that would betray Jesus. I cannot imagine how long it would have taken Jesus to be able to calm 12 men down in order to get them to listen to him again. But it happens. And Jesus tells them, if you're going to be great, you need to serve. And serving comes from the lowest points in society. If you can do that, then you will see real power, unlike anything of this world. It is harder to live into the identity of a Christian than it is to say you're a Christian. Right? It's harder to live into the ideal. What is a Christian? What do people see and understand? What do people think a Christian is? What do you think a Christian is? Is it easy to live up to that level? Or is it easier just to say, I go to the Christian church, I'm a Christian. We all have work to do. We can all deepen our faith and nurture our relationship with God, creation with humanity, by living into the identity that God would have us own. You need to know that through serving others and committing yourself to following Jesus, you are granted a place at the Lord's table in God's divine realm. You serve others. You are to commit to Christ. Even in the course of doing these two things, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to make mistakes. We all will. We all do. You think that there are some people that you don't need to serve. Or you think that you have an idea about how to go about serving others when in actuality what you would like to do is not what is requested, nor is it helpful. You'll look for faults in others, make excuses before acknowledging your own shortcomings. This is the scripture that we read last week. Seeing a splinter in the eye of someone else before removing the log from your own eye. There will be times when you think that you are greater than you really are. To quote Melina and Rohrbaugh, an accusation has the power to destroy while forgiveness has the power to restore. We all need to work on ourselves. And this is Labor Day weekend. Some of us celebrate, celebrate the labor that it is that we do for others. Some of us celebrate the labor that others do for us. <laughs> Some people just like to celebrate. At the end of the day, for those of us that are here, Christ calls on us to serve others, to labor for others. When Jesus tells his disciples to serve, he means for them to serve in a manner that is consistent with God's call for love, justice, and mercy for the people that are mistreated by a society that doesn't see them as full participants in the culture that rules the day. The marginalized people of Jesus' day and throughout most of biblical antiquity, the Bible were the orphans, the widows, the strangers, the aliens that are among you. Those were the people that did not have a social safety net to be protected from further impoverishment and would be what we consider today as at risk. When we love our at-risk neighbors, we are preparing ourselves to be received into the realm of Christ. 
The Passover meal, as recorded in Luke, is part of the Passion narrative. Teresa Strickland comments and concisely uh, uh, narrows down what the Passion narrative is. The, the Passion narrative tells the story of God's passion for us in Jesus Christ, showing us that God will spare nothing to tell us of the divine way of love and justice. Ironically, this message occurs in the midst of violence, degradation, and humiliation. We can become part of the passion narrative. To be fully immersed into the narrative, we too must become vulnerable and admit to our own weaknesses. Times that we have earned a nickname that we really don't want to carry along. We confess our weaknesses and ask forgiveness for ourselves in an effort to be assured of God's steadfast love for us. We have already chosen to journey with Christ. And this journey takes us to uncomfortable spaces of being with others that God also loves. Being here in worship together to gather around this table. Being here has us recognizing that we too have flaws to be left at Jesus' feet. So leave your sins with Jesus right alongside everybody else's. And here we are in communion as Jesus instructs. And here we get a glimpse of the kingdom where we are brothers and sisters to one another. Good morning. It struck me this morning that you know, when Jesus said, one who has his hands at the table has betrayed me, or will betray me, didn't they all? Except perhaps John. John may have been the only one who didn't really betray Jesus. Of course, Judas, we know, told the uh, Jewish uh, leaders where Jesus would be so that he could be brought into uh, captivity, bondage, and, and ultimately crucified. But then we remember Peter denied him three times to someone, straight to someone's face. And the other, if John, you know, kind of followed behind quietly. He was still in the, in the background. Um, but the others ran and hid. So I think they all betrayed Jesus. The thing is, could they forgive themselves? Judas was the one who was unable to forgive himself and ended his own life. And that's the consequence, I think, of being, not being able to forgive ourselves for the things that, that we have done or failed to do. And I was reminded in John 21 where Jesus helped Simon, I think, to forgive himself. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This is after Jesus' resurrection. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I was just wondering if perhaps Jesus asked those three questions to help Peter to forgive himself. We come to this table for so many reasons. We come to this table because we know that God has forgiven us. We come to this table to lay at the table the unforgiveness we may have of others. And we come to this table to receive the forgiveness ourselves, to accept that we have failed as we all have Yet, we are not going to live in bondage to that self-condemnation. We're going to lay it at the table and accept freely the forgiveness that's been given to us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after blessing it, he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. 
do this to remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of all sin. And in fact, I will not eat of this bread or drink of this cup again until I do so with you in the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we need forgiveness. We need to feel your forgiveness. We need to be able to forgive ourselves so that we can so freely, just as freely, forgive others. May we come to this table to lay upon it whatever unforgiveness we may have or may be experiencing and walk away free and empowered by your Holy Spirit to do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you come and get your elements and we'll take them together. the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. We've been, been talking about forgiveness um, for several weeks now, and I'm wondering if anyone has a story to share about what forgiveness has done for them in their own life. Again, as Brenda, you pointed out, forgiveness, the lack of forgiveness, worse than death. I know that I've been in situations that just through my own pride or whatever wanted to make something work pride <laughs> had this idea about how things should be but it really wasn't helpful didn't help me grow didn't help other people grow it really dragged um, everybody that was a part of that down and it's good that I got out of the situation. And it's good that I was able to, to see that it took time, it took other people um, to draw my attention to some of the things that were happening. But anyways, yeah, Brenda, you got a hand up? When I went on my Emmaus walk about, I don't know, 25 years ago or so, some odd number of years ago, there is a time during an Emmaus walk where, where you have this opportunity to really experience the totally unconditional love and forgiveness of, of God and through Jesus. 
quickly on the heels of feeling just that like wash over me, that unforgiveness or that forgiveness from God, I got a message from God that I was not I was not living in unforgiveness of my husband. I don't know if I ever told you this. It was right after basketball season, and coaches' wives may understand this, but during in season, um, your spouse is not available to help with the household responsibilities, to take care of the kids. And I was at a point where I was going to make a list. Here are all the things that I do, and here are all the things that you do. <laughs> and God said, uh-uh, that's not okay. That's not okay. Uh, first of all, it probably wasn't accurate. I was probably just feeling sorry for myself. But also, it just wasn't okay. If, if God's going to forgive, you know, totally for, un, forgive me for everything and live in unconditional love, then I have to do the same for my husband. And so, I don't know if you ever noticed a change after that, but I really tried to work on that during season and other times. But it, it is so powerful. When you feel the love and the forgiveness of God, it's so much easier to be able to forgive others. <laughs> yeah, you all couldn't hear that at home, but it sounds like Jim's getting ready to get back into coaching. <laughs> um, but yeah, to touch on a point, uh, this is Labor Day weekend. Um, it is a holiday. Schools are are getting ready to get uh, going full full speed ahead. Some of some schools in the area are already back in session. So for sure to be in prayer specifically for all our schools. There are so many different schools within our local within our local community. Of course, we know the public schools and the buildings that exist there, but there are other buildings, other schools that we might not see or that we forget. Um, you know, we can pray for Calvary. We can pray pray for Mackachee. We can pray for all this, the the individuals that homeschool and go out to the various camps that exist in Logan County too as well for their schooling. We have a preschool right here in the church. So many schools, so many education and educators, and again, uh, John spoke to all the different people that uh, it takes to uh, you know, maintain facilities and uh, just logistically to move children around and make sure that kids get what they need. There are so many different people that are involved at all kinds of different levels. Of course, the students, and the parents, um, siblings, there's it's everybody. It really, truly is. So to pray for our schools is a, a prayer for our community. Um, so take time to do that today. Yeah, Viola. Yeah, Riverside. Yeah. prayers for bullying for sure and and yeah just for the, the social interaction it's getting back yeah. into it so that's why this camera's here to make sure I behave <laughs> <laughs> She had a fall, and she's also trying to get to a, a medical appointment sometime this week. Um, other prayers? <laughs> oh, we all do. Yeah, I've got them. <laughs> for sure. We'll continue to pray for, for Deborah 
and, and also for Viola as, as they recover and, and get on track uh, so that their bodies can work as, as we wish that they would, you know, for sure. For sure. All right, John? Carol, your her relation to you again is stepmother. Stepmother. Carol. Carol. She's on the prayer list. So okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thanks for the update for those that are on our prayer list. Thank you very much. So uh, Carol Stevens and. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. So again, to put your brother's name on the prayer list for all of us again, your brother's Donald Cordry. Donald Cordry. Don Cordry. Oh. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you for the update, for Don. Any others? Let's go to God in prayer. God of mercy, we lift up to you uh, the names that have been lifted up, the people, Carol, Donald, Deborah, Viola, and others, of course, that are within our hearts. We lift up to you all of our different educational institutions, whether they be public, private, or in home. We ask you to cast the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly. We ask you to free us <coughs> from our ghettos of poverty and also from the ghettos of wealth that we might meet on level ground at the foot of the cross. In Christ's name, amen. Join with me now, if you will, in the benediction that comes from Shane Claiborne. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Ha, ha, ha.